In secret. In a faraway place. In search of a solution. Forty-six years of war, dispossession, and occupation. One side claimed the other had no right to be there or have a right to a state. The other said, why bother to make a deal with someone who must leave? You can't make a deal with someone who's not there. Then there was Oslo secret talks had been put together in Norway. I talked to both Israeli negotiators and Palestinian negotiators. And eventually, uh, I came to the understanding that the way it was organized in, in Washington couldn't possibly succeed. We spoke to several of the diplomats who have been involved in the peace process. Ambassador Georgian, like many others, says that the conference in Madrid was a necessary precursor to Oslo and important in itself. The formula was to get the Israelis and the Arabs, all the immediate Arab countries, to sit around the table in direct face-to-face -face negotiations. Uh, Hafez al-Assad, the president of Syria at that time, uh, who refused to even use the word Israel. Mm -hmm. When I got there in 1988 as ambassador, I used the word Zionist entity. Others had a different opinion. You had colossal delegations. They lived at um, different hotels. They never had meals together. They were brought uh, together with U.S. proposals coming uh, to, the, uh, to the desk, and then they went to their press conferences. And one of the first things I discovered when I spoke in Gaza and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, with the uh, Palestinian and, uh, and the Israeli negotiators was that they were telling me things which was exactly the opposite of what they were saying on television, because this was driven by their own constituencies. So in a way, they negotiated with their constituencies. The PLO was not allowed to participate. The Israelis wouldn't talk to them directly, and the Americans were forbidden by one of their own peculiar roles from ever talking to one of the two most important parties to the disputes. Rather, we seek peace, real peace. We, in, in a way, we decided to do exactly the opposite of what they did in Washington. In Oslo, the PLO and the Israelis came up with a declaration of principles. The PLO recognized Israel, the state, as sovereign and independent and ruling over 78% of historic Palestine, while Israel recognized a political organization, the PLO, as a representative of the Palestinian people. And they agreed to the establishment of self-rule in the occupied territories. But were the Oslo Accords a step forward from Madrid? I think they're a step forward because, in my view, they constituted direct face-to-face -face negotiations. The big revolution was the mutual recognition between the national uh, movement of Palestine and, uh, and Israel. There were only two things left to do, inform the Americans and hold a photo op. The world would react as if a transcendent diplomatic miracle had occurred. Then it began to fall apart. How could that be if the Oslo agreements were the first step on the road to salvation? Arafat wanted the recognition that Oslo conferred upon him and the PLO as the spokesman for the Palestinian national movement. But if you look at Oslo, at the content of Oslo, it was, uh, in a sense, a very weak uh, agreement. And it uh, provided a number of advantages to Israel, one of them being 
that it did not concretize the idea of the 67 lines as the um, basic framework for a Palestinian state. But there was a solution, Oslo too. It contained the key statement, neither side shall initiate or take any step that will change the status of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, pending the outcome of the permanent status negotiations. Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli prime minister who signed the accords, was assassinated by a right-wing Israeli because he agreed to loosening Israel's control over the occupied Palestinian territories, or what religious Zionists call Judea and Samaria. A blood-stained copy of Shir La Shalom, Song of Peace, was found in Rabin's pocket, and it was sung at his funeral. The main point, if you ask me, was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. There is no question that Oslo was thwarted by the extremists on both sides. I think that uh, it was mainly uh, Hamas and the extreme organizations on the Palestinian side and uh, the uh, rightist uh, organizations on the Israeli side, which actually uh, thwarted the, this uh, effort. Oslo too turned out to be even less of a solution than Oslo. Instead of deoccupying and uniting the newly autonomous territories, the new agreement divided the areas and subjugated them to new layers of control. The diplomats still believed in the process. Oslo cemented the uh, uh, position of the two-state solution. By creating something of a, an architectural foundation, maybe when the negotiations resume, there will be a, a stronger foundation. The solution? Resume the peace process. With handshakes and photo ops, to be followed by an even greater peace process, a Camp David summit where everything could be agreed. Except it wasn't. <coughs> this time, instead of an agreement that failed, there was a failure to agree. But in 2002, a new peace initiative came from a surprising direction, at least surprising to the West. The Arab League proposed a simple but sweeping deal, land for peace, return to the 1967 borders, in return for peace with all the Arab nations and a guarantee of security. Sharon rejected it. George W. Bush marginalized it. Yeah, I'm just following your example. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> In 2001, the worldwide war on terror had been launched, so it seemed a good time to relaunch the peace process in tandem. Into the quartet, the UN, the US, Russia, and the EU all got together to produce the roadmap to peace. Yes, it's time to bring back the peace process. America does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. The last 20 years, I've seen the Israeli settler population go from 200,000 to 600,000. Let there be no doubt, the situation for the Palestinian people is intolerable. And America will not turn our backs on the legitimate Palestinian aspiration for dignity, opportunity, and a state of their own. And Israel must also live up to its obligation to ensure that Palestinians can live and work and develop their society. Obama met with Abbas. He met with Netanyahu. He ordered Netanyahu to stop building settlements in the West Bank. Well, look, Israeli settlements under international law, let's be clear, are illegal. What possible response could there be? 
relaunch the peace process. The parties sh should be focused on making progress towards the direct negotiations. These negotiations are like the walking dead. I mean, they are a zombie. Netanyahu immediately announced more settlements. Every time a secretary of state comes to the region, they build more settlements, they announce expansion of settlement units. Please stop coming to visit us. We cannot afford these visits. Is there reason to expect that this time it will be different? There has been um, a colossal improvement. The donor community has deemed that the, the uh, Palestinian Authority now has all the features uh, which, qualify, which qualifies them to have a state. The music is different today. They know the permanent solution. They know more or less the concessions that they have to do. The ideological step has already been taken. To demonstrate his commitment, Kerry picked a key aid. It is a daunting and humbling challenge, but one that I cannot desist from. Martin Indyk was the director of research for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee for many, many years. That's the core of the Israel lobby. And then he convinced a major donor to establish a think tank that would give a more academic, a more objective tone to pro-Israel advocacy. That's the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. So Martin Indyk has worked at two of the great pillars of Israel advocacy in America. Uh, the United States is sending us someone who has worked as an Israel advocate. I would insist he sits on the Israeli side of the table with the Israelis. Has each and every one of these attempts had its own individual and unique set of flaws? Or is there an inherent problem? The basic premise was mistaken, that you could have a uh, process of building of confidence between an occupier and the occupied one, that that was not going to work. So it was doomed from, from the start. So, is it a process? Yes. Does it bring peace? Absolutely not. Then what shall we call it? The occupation process, the distraction process, the flim flam, the long con, the hustle, the sting, the swindle. Why don't we just call it the process? Both the Palestinians and the Arab states keep coming back to the same uh, formula of third party mediation. I do not see this as a, a US monopoly, even though the US and many of its allies see it as a monopoly. The PLO uh, wants the US to be uh, involved. They believe that only the US, if anyone, can deliver uh, Israel. Realistically, the United States is the 900 pound gorilla on the block. You cannot keep them away from the negotiating table. What would have taken America's place had the United States said, we're not interested here? Would regional powers have emerged that would have played a more constructive role? Is it in the Palestinian interest for that third party to be the Israel's closest ally? I have Israel's back. Is America an honest broker? Can it be an honest broker? We, the United States, may not be an honest broker, but we can be an effective broker. The United States is the worst possible mediator because it is bound, literally hand and foot, by this 1975 commitment not to go one iota beyond the Israeli position. I do believe that America is part of uh, the deception policy. And uh, they, they try to, all the time to help the Israelis and send these uh, false signals to the Arab uh, and Muslim countries that the America trying to uh, help in the peace process. I had a conversation with some very senior Egyptian policymakers, and they were quite critical of the American role in the peace process. And I said, you know, it may be that a time will come when the United States will simply have to throw up its hands and say we failed and hand this over to somebody else. And the panic in the eyes of these uh, uh, policymakers was, was manifest. That's the genius of the process. As long as the United States remains Israel's patron, it will always be indispensable to the process. Can the United States ever break with Israel? And will the United States actually push the Israelis? The United States, when its national interest has dictated this, 
has again and again laid down the law to Israel. When Amer the American national interest dictated that uh, the United States imposed something on Israel, it did. In 1974-75 with Kissinger, at Camp David number one with Carter, and then Bush and Baker at Madrid, the U.S. has in fact used its special relationship with Israel to induce Israel to take some risks that it would not ordinarily make. Why hasn't that happened with Palestine? The United States doesn't have any real dog in the fight, whereas the Israelis really care about this. The conventional wisdom is that it's very much in America's interest to have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolved. Israel has become a liability to the U.S., and several American generals have made that clear. But actually, finding a solution to this conflict would benefit U.S. interests, as cynical as that may sound, and yet the U.S. fails to do anything about it. So why doesn't the United States put pressure on Israel? Is American diplomacy handcuffed by domestic politics? Over 400 of America's foremost evangelical leaders together in one room with a single purpose, to speak and act with one voice in support of Israel. There are clearly limitations uh, based, based on American domestic politics, not because of a conspiracy, but uh, significantly because there's a very, very strong strain of Christian Zionism that exists in the American body politic. When the Obama administration began, it was very open that it wanted to halt settlement expansion. Vice President Joseph Biden travels to the region, delivers this message, and is, is met with almost ridicule. And then Prime Minister Netanyahu comes to Congress and delivers a speech where he gets more standing ovations than the U.S. president does in his State of the Union address. Israel has no better friend than America and America has no better friend than Israel. The Israeli lobby is a very significant factor. And so you see in this moment that the U.S. administration is actually hamstrung even when it wants to do something. It's the same with the people with the, with the gun lobby. It's the same with senior citizens. It's the same with farmers. American politics rewards people who are well organized and passionate. That's the way American politics works. When America invests in Israel's security, Israel is safer and America is stronger. Israel lobby, which is not a conspiracy, like the NRA and other lobbies, it's just talented. It does what it does and knows how to leverage power and benefits from fortune of convergence with some U.S. interests. But it also benefits from the fact that there are no consequences for American decision makers for violating Palestinian human rights systematically, in, in gross systematic ways. Another explanation is that there is a division of power. America calls the shots in the wider region. Israel calls the shots next door. The so-called peace process was used as an instrument of power by Israel to pursue its policies of annexation and, and settlements to act with impunity, which is what the U.S. wanted. The Palestine issue is not that important to the United States. Oil is important. Egypt is important. Winning the Cold War and winning Egypt over from the Soviets was important. It is understood that on this issue, which is, by the way, by far the most important issue to the Israelis. Or is there a more imperial reason never to be spoken aloud? Is Israel the testing grounds for America's wars? Back in the Cold War, it was Israel that went up against the Soviet-built armor and Russian MiGs. After Arab states joined the United States to drive Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, Washington had a vision of a Pax Americana in the Middle East, a place of free trade and free markets. And in the Middle East, Israel would be at the center of it. The people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Then America switched to the war on terror along with generals, intelligence officers, and police forces from all over the world, they look to Israel. From the traditional battlefield to low-intensity conflicts, today's sophisticated... Israel had experience running an occupation with enhanced interrogations, mass incarcerations, targeted assassinations, surveillance with drones, urban warfare, homeland security, and combined police military operations. And experimentations happen where? In the West Bank, Gaza, and Lebanon. I think that Israel receives so much from the U.S. Israel is constantly trying to show the ways in which it, in fact, purely on realist terms, benefits uh, the United States.
Be that as it may, America continues to send money to Israel to develop weapon systems like Iron Dome. The system estimates the track threat's points of impact and selects to intercept only those that will fall in the protected area. Under Obama, the U.S. invested about $275 million in the system, with another $610 million to come. And so speaking of peace and preparing for war are destined to go hand in hand. They are all the time taking the side of Israel, and uh, they try all the time uh, to uh, pressure the Palestinian to give more concessions and compromises. And the only one who benefiting from all these talks is just the Israelis. Yes. Speaking about the public in Israel, I mean, there, there are those who believe that peace is our vital national interest, and those who believe that the status quo is our vital national interest, and the government is representing the latter. I think we can take as a baseline that one should probably be pessimistic. Well, I think you have people uh, who get hooked on to this uh, Middle East process. I hate the word peace process. Uh, to me, it's like a, a food processing machine, you know, process for the sake of process. Nine months will produce a stillborn baby, I promise you. No, nothing, nothing will come of this. Is there a way forward, or are all the parties doomed to walk in the same circles, round and round, over and over again, as Israel becomes stronger and richer, but more like an occupying power. As each cycle of American politicians using the Middle East for photo ops, and the Palestinian territories are eaten away, bite by settlement bite. Got no peace.